Yeah, hello again. This is episode number 21. Okay, um, today I want to talk a little bit about um, tone stacks and how to dial in great tones with any kind of amplifier. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the uh, new X or Nux or Nux um, Cerberus uh, multi effects pedal which we have here. I was just using some of the delay and reverb um, in this intro. Um, but yeah, let's start with a heavy part. What is what is a tone control? What is an EQ? What is it good for? What does it sizzle? You know, uh, fuzzy sounds, um, woody sounds. We have all these kinds of funny words to describe tones, especially those that we don't like. Um, so maybe we have to go back and um, learn a little bit about the history of the EQ or the tone stack in a guitar amp. Well, in the old days, like on this beautiful old Marshall here, we had bass, mid, treble, and presence. Okay, some Fender amps don't have the middle. They have only bass and treble, and the mid are kind of set to a fixed level. Um, but most amps do have bass, mid, and treble. And some amps like this beautiful triamp has even three of those tone stacks. So there are three amp sections and each amp section has its own tone stack. Um, so it's getting more and more knobs um, and there are different kind of ideas behind these tone stacks in amplifiers. And we, we do have our own special concept um, with the amp one again. Um, so maybe it's good to have a look at some frequency spectrum graphics that we um, have been prepared, that we prepared for this episode. Um, maybe we have one, sec one picture with the frequency in the band. Can we see that one? There's um, like a, um, a picture that shows there's different instruments in the band. So this is actually from the M1 instruction manual to make you aware of you are not alone. When you are playing in your living room, of course you can dial in whatever you like and everything will work because anything that sounds good to you will simply cut through because there's probably nobody else and that's all what matters. So no worries about home situation, but as soon as you get somebody playing with you, there's some other frequencies coming into the spectrum. And these kind of frequencies produced by other instruments will fight against your frequencies. So the secret of a good sounding band is that every of the players in the band will find or has found his own like niche, like this is where I have the kick drum, this is where I have the snare drum. This is, and it, it is also down to the size of the drum kit. You know, if you have a 26 inch bass drum or a 22 or even a smaller one and how you tune the whole thing. And the same with the snare drum, you know. Um, and then there's the bass guitar. And of course we as guitar players also want to have bass in our chunk, chunk, chunk. Um, but if we are using the same frequency like the bass player, we will have a horrible, muddy, mushy sound on stage. And if you are playing with uh, a big PA system in a big hall, and if the guy, uh, the front of house engineer, the sound engineer, cannot separate the two instruments, it will simply be horrible because in the room everything is reflected again and it will all be muddy, no fun. So. The secret of a great sounding band is everybody has found his own place um, in the frequency spectrum for the instrument. Um, to me, the perfect example for, for instance is ACDC when it comes to rock music. In ACDC you can hear the guitar is kind of 
the loudest thing. Um, the vocals are higher than the guitar. The snare drum has, you know, the, the snare wires, they are like higher than the vocals, but the, the snare tuning is lower than the guitar. It's kind of in between the guitar and the bass. The bass is lower and the bass drum is even lower. So what I'm saying is ACDC found a recipe how to place their individual frequency spectrums around those beautiful Marshall stacks because in this band there is no big EQ on the guitars. It is, it is just the sound of rock, pure as it can be. We did it in another episode, you know, with one of my plexis with this one cranked and um, there is no magic to it. It's simply a loud, hot driven Marshall plexi and an S SG or a Gretsch, you know, the guitars. And there is no funny post EQing or, no, there's nothing. And I believe the sound was created in the rehearsal room. Okay, so how did they dial in the tone? Well, this was fairly simple because they placed the, the stacks there, <laughs> they plugged in the guitar, they cranked the volume on their Marshall stacks, and then um, the singer had only one chance to survive to be higher than the guitar. <laughs> so this was the answer, <laughs> screaming above the guitar um, range. And the bass player, it's the classic thing, he went down with the bass amp using whatever, the classic MPEG uh, SVT stack or whatever. And then of course they were, I'm sure they tried different drum tunings and one day they found it. And then of course it's a process, you go to the studio and you find, uh, you know, particular drums work better and so on. Um, so, just to give you an idea of a totally different sound would be Bob Marley and the Wailers, you know, reggae music. You know, the drum um, has an even higher um, snare drum, you know, very high and the bass is ultra low. And the guitar, there is no big guitar, there's just a check, check. And all the, you know, the frequencies are totally different from ACDC. ACDC is mid-range and like, the wall of sound and uh, the reggae music is a lot of bass and a lot of nice high-end uh, different placement and therefore they preferred mostly you know, Fender amps and clean tones. Um, okay, but now what can we learn from, from that? Um, one thing is if you go to re the rehearsal room you should try and set up with the other guys. So you place your amp and then you probably dial in something but you have to check with the other guys. Uh, ah, okay. I prepared the switching system. Okay, now I'm... Okay, I'm on this setup here right now. Um, I would like to show you um, a few tone stacks. So just that you know what's at hand, here or at your end or whatever. This is the amp one and I would like to check something with this tri amp here. Let me see if it works. Yeah, it works. So, um, so now I'm on the clean channel and if I dial this in like middle position, sounds okay, but hmm, I was always using some totally different setup and most people didn't dare to do that. So my recipe for a good clean tone on this amp was get the mids all the way up to 10. So maybe you can hear now that 
the guitar is getting more in front. And the next thing is, I probably dial in just a little bit of treble. So, okay, this is the clean sound on this one. Let me try the amp one. Okay, get rid of the. I got my custom control here, which gives me this extra sparkle. Let's see how that sounds on the other. So this is like closer to the triumph, which is kind of counterclockwise the darker sound on the amp one. So now. This is the triamp, and this is the amp one. So to me, this is even a bit more present in a nice way. And if you watch, we are in the middle position, 5-5-5. Five, five, five. So, and this one is having the mids on full and the bass kind of 2 o'clock. I put the other twos in the middle, so we have kind of something that looks cool. Um, back to the triumph. And now compared to the amp one. Okay, I want a little bit of that customer. So pretty similar. Um, can we show the diagram of the amp one EQ? So when we look at this diagram, we can see um, the green color, which is the mid control. We can see the red, which is the treble. We can see the blue, which is the bass. And um, the thing you can see on top is kind of, uh, which is indicated as sum. Sum means this is like five, 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 middle position. Yeah, and then you can see what you can do when you kind of decrease the different um, controls. The treble will get rid of all that treble um, and in the middle position it was almost flat. It was kind of almost some was kind of a flat line. Okay and I've done this because I wanted to use this EQ as a master EQ for all the channels. So the character that I dialed in on the triamp is already in the preamp itself, like on this clean channel. And then I can use this kind of three band tone control, this tone stack, to tweak the overall sound of all channels. So why did I choose that kind of concept? Because I wanted to have a tone control on the amp one that kind of matches different cabinets because at different rooms. Um, you know, me personally, I like the vintage Marshall cabinets. This is what I grew up with from the 60s with the big, thick grill cloth made from paper, not that modern stuff. And the, the speakers are mounted from the rear. And this kind of gives you the, the, what I lo love about the, the fat vintage tone that is not harsh and is not sizzling. Um, so today's cabinets sometimes have a lot more high end um, and I don't like those cabinets that much. Um, you know, it all affects, so my idea was to have a tone control that is able to compensate speakers. 
Therefore, you should not be afraid to reduce the treble on the uh, amp one. And so let me show you um, what I can do from this kind of setting here. I can increase the treble. I put it back to the middle, give it a little reverb for fun. Or I can reduce it. And now there's also something different. When I turn the treble control on this tone stack, all the rest stays the same. When we look at the same, um, can we show the, 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 the diagram again? Um, when, when, when we reduce the treble, you can see everything which is not treble is exactly the same no matter what I dial in on the treble control. If I use some other amplifier, like, yeah, we can show, um, which one did we measure? I think we measured Uli's, uh, uh, Uli John Roth's, um, what, what is it, the Black Star? Yeah, so, and it's an artisan, yeah. This, this amp, you see, turning the treble from zero to 10 um, changed also the mids and the bass. So um, that's, you turn one knob and the rest of the whole frequency spectrum starts to shift or do, do weird things. And um, sometimes these old designs use that to create the fundamental character. But, um, and it's okay if your amp is like a one channel amp, then you have only you know, one tone stack you dial in and that's, that's all. But if you have sev several channels, it's getting all over the place. Therefore, I chose to have our tone stack to be just affecting the one band that you are touching. When you touch treble, you can have more or less treble, but without affecting anything else. So that's the way um, we, we designed it here. Um, okay, as a rule of thumb, there's a few things you should know about clean tones in general. You know, I was actually giving it, you know, maximum on this triamp. Um, the reason for that is I'm using the triamp with the blue box here, which is kind of my Marshall-esque speaker emulation. This is the, um, the stack 1970, the one that I always use. And this is um, the, 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 the old greenbacks um, and they, they make this nice rock tone, which is great for overdrive, but um, versus a Fender amp, it needs more mids because the Fender amp is an open back and then um, a, a Fender has a lot more mids. So therefore we have to crank the mids on this kind of uh, amplifier. So listening to the amp one, it is, um, yeah, it's super easy. Put everything in the middle and then uh, dial in what you like. So here's like, now the custom control, give it a little bit sparkle. We all love sparkle, especially me. Okay, compared to the triamp. Okay, no reverb. But no treble, full, full treble. Listen to the bass. When I change the treble, I just play the bass note. It's kind of the same effect like when I crank the treble at the end, the bass gets, gets lost. So this is the way the old school tone stacks work. 
it's okay if you have separate for separate channels but you know Im imagine you would dial something in on an overdrive channel with this kind of tone stack it wouldn't make it would you know kill all the low end that you want and here I, I have the low end and I can add a, some some trouble to it okay let's listen to um, some drive sounds here <laughs> So that's the M1. What have I done? I was turning knobs and I was check, 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 check. While doing that, what, what, uh, what was I looking for? So, um, this is my process. <laughs> so I have like a, I, it's just a simple chuck kind of thing. And then I'm looking for the bass, the mids and the highs. And then, of course, I need a balanced frequency spectrum. So when you look at the settings now, bass is full, mids is almost full, and the treble is almost in the middle. So, so the treble gives me the bite. I'm looking for this kind of big low end, you know, Jimi Hendrix style. Okay, that's me. If you are playing with other guys in the band, be careful with the low end. This is almost down. Versus full. To me, there's a little magic when I have all this bass because the, the bass is a lot of energy and the energy saturates the power amp stage and, you know, the whole signal path and that makes the sound squashy, bigger and... <laughs> Yeah, the way more vintage feel. That's 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 my kind of thing. Okay, but back to the chuck. It's like no mids doesn't work for me. So this is like underwater sound. So now is the question: Where is the sweet spot for the mids? I tried to find, you know, when I had it on full, I thought it was too eh, ugly, kind of eh, eh. So I back it up a bit. And this is now my personal thing. I'm always looking for the O. There's like an O in the strat. <laughs> Versus ah, 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 okay? So 
and this is of course with the mids if you if you increase the mids you get more r so i know it's a bit harder to play that way but i think it sounds bigger it sounds more pleasant to the listener and uh, that's my tone um, but finding the tone is finding that vocal sound in your head it's like I have an expectation of what I want to hear and that's vocal oh uh, you know that's that's what I want to hear and I dial in the control to find that vocal spectrum when I play my guitar I have to readjust with different guitars of course <laughs> So here I have the feeling that um, I can have more different tones from the channel. It's more expressive and also to have this kind of accents gives me uh, another um, color and I, I need to balance both. It's like... Okay, try different settings on the treble, full for now. It's too aggressive for the strat and zero just for extreme. This is kind of behind the carpet. So in the middle. Yeah. So this is where it speaks the most to me, for my style, okay? And... Sounds pretty nice. Just for fun, compare what's going on on the... Yeah. getting closer if I want to be close I mean I have um, yeah just for fun I try to follow this the sound a little bit <laughs> yeah this sounds even richer to me and <laughs> up that's my cup of tea so um, yeah this was the vintage channel let's see what we have here on the triamp with the 3a <laughs> 
Oh, you know what? Just have a different guitar for... Just for fun. What about my Les Paul? Ah. They call it humbucker. <laughs> but... Okay. Fair enough. I think there's the same amount of hum on my Strat than on this Les Paul. Who cares? It's authentic. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this was this channel here. If we look at the tone stack again, you can see there's a lot of bass. That's kind of my sound. Um, similar mids like on the other channel, you know, it's kind, kind of two o'clock. And then there is um, the treble even more reduced. But okay, let's double check if I want more. No, it doesn't hurt. So give it a bit more treble with this guitar. That's cool. Huh. Now the whole thing sounds a bit muddy. Um, maybe, yes? Or maybe not modern enough. So, what is the solution for that? Um, we can tighten it up, we can use a little pedal, we can use an EQ. Let's try this TC Spark booster um, and plug this into, oops, the signal path. Um, see what we can do with this so so with this kind of setting it's unity gain and it's not a different EQ. So I put like the bass and the middle uh, control in the middle. Um, the level is unity gain and there is um, a three position switch for fat, clean, which I'm using and mid. So mid is a mid boost that makes a mid hump. Fat is uh, a mid boost that is a lower mid hump <laughs> and clean is no hump at all. So. Let me show you what happens when I reduce the bass, when I increase the volume of the guitar and then reduce the bass. Versus off. On, off, off, 
on. So, reducing the bass in front of the overdrive tightens up the tone. That's, by the way, the same recipe that Eddie Van Halen was using with his plexi. If you watch our episode, oh, I forgot the number, with Eddie Van Halen, something like 17 or in that kind of range. Um, his recipe was to use the graphic EQ, reducing the low end and the high end in front of a traditional Marshall amplifier, plexi, and um, thereby getting rid of this muddiness rumble. Um, the other way to do that would be simply boost the mids. Many guitar players used to have overwound pickups to get, you know, higher output and more mids to get that kind of grip feel and this kind of, uh, yeah, how to describe it, uh, aggressiveness and um, in your face attack. Um, I was more the vintage guy and I used pedals to do that. I mean, if it's a, an EQ pedal, um, if it's a booster that kind of has a low ro uh, roll off, that that's, was always my recipe. Or like the Spark, it's a, it's a very simple um, to understand pedal. So this, this would be the thing to get a tight low end. Okay, just for fun, I give it a bit mid-range, see the mid-switch. Now you have so much mid-range, you can even reduce the mids a little bit on the amp and get that scoop tone, okay? <laughs> I switch it off and you will hear it's It's too muddy, okay. So, okay, do you get the idea? You can tweak the tone in the tone stack which is usually post overdrive because this was the tone stack of the overdrive channel of the triamp or we can do the same here on the amp one and you can tweak the tone between the guitar and the input which is pre distortion so um, i could do it with the good old Marshall here, just for fun, see if it's still alive. <laughs> um, bam, bam. OK. 
Okay, the indicator is dead, but who cares? Uh, Okay, so tube amp needs a little time to warm up, okay? So when I dial in the tone corners here, you will not hear much, see? that you really hear is the mid-range. Why? Because the mid-range gives you the level for the overdrive. Because the saturation that we hear is created not before that stage, it's more created in the stage post the tone control. So this is like, you know, non-master volume, everything on full, bridged inputs all the way. So this is more like a level control and kind of a pre-EQ. This is kind of the thing that I have here in the Spark. So I can reduce the bass to make it tighter and give it more mids. And the treble here. It's similar to the curve that we showed you earlier. It's more affecting the bass than the treble. Of course it's affecting the treble, but it's also affecting the bass. And as you can see, this amp is super easy to dial in because you have no other chance to get it overdriven. And this were the good old old school days. So what you can learn from this lesson is very simple. Once you have more options, you have to know how to dial them in. I mean, you know, people trust that this is one of the best marshals ever, blah, blah, blah. And I bought it because it's one of the best marshals ever, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but um, it produces only this one particular sound, which is great. And I recorded with this amp a lot. It has a beautiful character, but it's a one trick pony. And of course, you can work with overdrive pedals and uh, get this kind of thing in different directions. I show you with my Strat. Uh, maybe I get the real. tuner first <laughs> uh, just for I've been gigging last week which was great by the way um, you know COVID-19 is not a, it's not um, a good time for musicians um, I miss playing live so much but we had one of those exceptions outdoor on a nice island here in our area and we had beautiful weather and how many people, I don't know. Um, of course, everything is restricted and people have to be uh, guided in, but we still had like 250, 300 people um, in a huge place. So nobody was uh, having too much contact. Yeah, okay, anyway. And by the way, this week I have a little tour with um, um, a guy from Finland, uh, a killer guitar player, Ben Granfeld, who used to play um, in the Leningrad Cowboys and in um, Wishbone Ash, and he's got his own how many solo records. He, yeah, he is a, a nice, a nice guitar player, very good taste, um, Ben Granfeld, and we do little little three gig tour, which is 
the exception from the rules. Unbelievable. We play clubs, so we have uh, also restrictions. Um, so we play 45 minutes, then we have 30 minutes break to get fresh air in <laughs> for the audience and the band, and then we come back for the second set for another 45 minutes. Um, yeah, anyway, another experience in these crazy times. Um, so, okay, anyway, back to the sound here. <laughs> You know why I like this amp, you know? It really talks. And of course, um, yeah, this is, I chosen this, this amp with this guitar. And, and here, this is, I'm doing everything with my volume on the guitar. It's clean. The sound is killer and what you know I remember playing this amp in the studio and now I listen with the blue box which is like you know there is no mic there is no real cabinet there is just this amp the blue box and a load and it sounds as it should <laughs> Okay, anyway, so that's the old school way to have this kind of beautiful amp and that's all um, it takes. And then you do whatever else uh, with the volume control on the guitar and maybe a boost pedal. But maybe you understood that not changing the tone here will keep you in the same place in the band because you know the amp is just having one tone stack and that and the amp makes the noise different from what's the input depending on the boost or the guitar or how clean the guitar is but I'm never changing any of the frequencies inside the amp um, so the lesson here is the moment you have multiple tone stacks you are responsible <laughs> to make the different tone stacks work in a way that the guitar doesn't jump from one spectrum to another spectrum so that's something i found with many amateur players you know, especially top 40 guys, they have beautiful pre presets in their multi-effects or in their amplifiers, but they switch from one sound, which is probably clean or overdriven or whatever, to, the, to another sound, and they simply get lost. They are not audible anymore. They are out of the mix. You can hear the drums because the drums are still the same frequency spectrum, but the guitar changed the frequency spectrum and bam, disappeared. So my lesson, and this is what I always have done with the Triumph, was I wanted to make sure that my clean channel matches the frequencies of the other channel. Okay, I will do this in a minute, but for now, I'm just curious. Uh. And that's the M1. Yeah, so you 
you can hear where my inspiration comes from. Great amp, great amp. Um, okay, I wanted to show you how I match the three EQs, uh, the Marshall off. So, with the different channels. Okay, this was M1, and now back to the... tight switch that keeps uh, the low end a bit tighter from but I get rid of all the bass I want all the mids and some treble okay and this is Oops, this sounds too scooped for my ears. Get back some mids and reduce the highs. would set up the three different EQs and now looking at the tone controls you find the treble is not so way not so high especially with not with a strat and I have um, yeah reduced the mids to match the whole um, amp all the different channels um, so what I'm doing is I play one sound and I try to memorize what I'm hearing and I switch to the next sound and I try that this kind of is in the same range and then I go back and forth back and forth back and forth and then I do it with another channel and the and then the third channel and then all three channels this is the way I kind of do the whole thing on the amp one the life is probably a bit easier because um, it's you know everything now here is in the middle position there's my clean tone there's my wind <laughs> Then there's my classic channel. Wow, it's loud. Okay, reduce the And that's the modern channel. Um, so anyway, we can kind of we, we don't have to do much. We, we just tweak the, the channels with the custom controls to get the, the right kind of character for the guitar. And then all channels will match automatically. This is uh, what I learned from the good old Marshall. It's like having pedals in front of one tone stack. And that's, uh, it's not pedals. This is amps in, in front of one tone stack that is kind of neutral and then can uh, arrange the frequency needs, so to speak. Um, okay, 
I have a few comments that I have um, to make. Um, some people, you know, it's like they, they say, ah, oh, the M1 is too fuzzy, fizzy, uh, whatever. Well, if that's the case, I, I show you how to do it. It's so simple. Let me get uh, the classic channel and make. <laughs> If I crank the treble and reduce the mids, I have a fuzzy tone. And this also depends on the cabinet. If I have a different cabinet here, I switch to another one. Let's me see. Let's use the stack 65 here, which has a different high end. Then it sounds, I don't know, fuzzy in a way. So what I do, I, I simply increase the mids. Let's put it back to the middle position. More mids. And mostly the, the problem is already solved. And sometimes you can reduce the treble as well. You know, the good thing about our treble control here is it does not affect all the rest. So you can dial in whatever you like without killing the rest of your tone. So treble on zero is kind of okay. Depending on the speaker. Let's have the brightest speaker in this blue box here, which is the stack 71. This is the Zizzle speaker of them all. I give you normal treble so you, you understand what I mean. So here's your sizzle. So reduce the treble to zero. No sizzle. And then give it a bit mids. Okay, I mean, um, it's not the best sound because I prefer the other cabinet, but the sizzle is gone. And I could reduce the mids now. Or give it a little bit more bass. For example, I have another one here, which is stack 80, and then I need a different tone control setting here. Go back with the treble, reduce the middle. Okay, that's the setting I would choose. And you can see, reduce treble, a little bit more mids, and I'm happy. So back to my stack 70. I want it normal. <laughs> so. That's my tone. I like it when it has a, you know, this kind of little bit too much trouble. That's my kind of personal, just for the fun of the sparkle. Okay, 
I hope you understood um, how to cook um, a good tone. And of course, amplifiers do have a certain voicing and the flexibility you find in tone controls can change the character slightly. But um, it is finding the perfect match for what you play. This is why you have to check out amps and, or channels or whatever and then tweak it. And just summing it up, tweaking means trying to get the frequency spectrum that matches your playing, the situation of the band and has something like organic from bass to, to, to treble. And um, of course it depends on the music, but the tone starts in your head. You have to know what you want, otherwise you just dial in knobs and you get lost. And uh, here's my comment, if you are at this point, if you get lost, call a sound doctor. And uh, we had a, a great guest the other day, which was Gundi Keller. So uh, if you get lost in MIDI, if you get lost in tone, if you get lost with your gear, uh, maybe you have a good music store or you can uh, check uh, Gundi Keller because uh, he He's got so much experience uh, with, with gear, all kinds of gears, because um, he owns a collection of tube amps, he plays the amp one, he plays you know, the first version, the new version, the Mercury, the Iridium, and um, he has a studio, he's got big ears, he knows what's going on. So this kind of people um, you should consult if you are <laughs> Um, yeah, if, if, if you need some extra um, help. Okay, maybe it's time for some questions uh, at this point. Let's see. Um, Jens Geilich, uh, in German again. Ich sehe gerade, dass du bis in den roten Bereich Clipping bei der Blue Box gehst. Ist das okay? also okay und kein Problem? Bist Jetzt versuche ich immer das zu vermeiden. Okay, I translate to English. Um, he just um, saw that I'm using the blue box and the clip LED was uh, also on, like uh, turning to red. And um, the clip LED is kind of okay when it's red, if it's not red all the time. Um, you know, a speaker to me sounds best when it's driven harder. And then it's kind of an extra compression and it's, it changes the tone. And we've done something analog here in the blue box to emulate the speaker behavior. So it, it, it's, it's a nice thing. And I don't mind to have a hot driven, driven speaker. Um, so it's okay in the blue box. Just make sure it's not red all the time. It should be switching from green, green, and then peaks should be red. And, uh, to me, it sounded okay, so I didn't, actually I forgot about to watch, but um, when I did the sound check, it was in between green and red. And that's the good, um, the good message for you guys out there. When you play live at the sound check, you usually, you know, everybody is, oh, way too loud, so you turn down, and then when the drummer starts playing, you are not loud enough. And that's the moment where you increase the master, and then you have more volume, and then the blue box gets maybe red. And it doesn't matter because it doesn't sound shit. So the, the saturation in the blue box is organic. Um, it is um, sounding actually pretty good. Just make sure it's not too much. Okay, that's question number one. Uh, Lydian Lover. Hello, what's better using the M1 direct output as a speaker simulator? As a, uh, okay, uh, uh, output as a speaker uh, and plug to PA or as a head for a cabinet. Well, you know, if it's, if you can get the real deal Marshall here and the real deal M1 vintage channel into a cabinet, that is where I feel the electric guitar makes me happy. So get a real deal cabinet and if you can afford it, I mean, not money-wise, if you can afford to play a real cabinet 
a real guitar cabinet with a real M1, man, that's the tone. This is where I'm, I'm from. And I tried to, to, to get everything I know from these beautiful old M's into this box, in this M1 box, um, in a way that it's the real deal. And with a real guitar speaker, you will have fun. Of course, it's okay to use the direct out and it's probably much better than a lot of other gear um, because it's so organic and it's, you know, dynamic, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the, it shines when it's on a real guitar speaker that matches the amp. I mean, one of ours or some nice old Marshall cabinets or orange cabinets or Buchner cabinets or... You know, there are some, some out, out there and some that don't match the M1. You know, there's always like better and worse combinations. Um, but anyway, so next question, Andre by email. Um, Greetings from Tokyo. Uh, love this Academy of Tone series and really appreciate you talking, taking the time and effort to educate the world of, on tone. Oh, yeah. Uh, just wondering if you can educate us on the sonic differences on using high pass and low pass filters in front and in the effects loop of M1 or general tube amps. Um, also as bonus, if not too much to ask using two filters after load box in reamp, using those filters after load box in reamp setup. Okay, let's first, the, the first part of the question is actually what I just showed is like using the spark in front of the amp and you know kind of the interface between the guitar and the amp and to match the frequency so you, so you have the best out of your amplifier circuit with a booster or with an EQ I mean he's talking about high pass low pass filter what is a high pass filter well it <laughs> It lets the high frequencies pass and cuts the low end, and and a low pass is the other way around. Uh, lets the low end pass and um, kind of uh, kills um, the high end. So these are the treble and the bass on on the spark booster here, for instance. And um, by the way, you could also use something like that or like a graphic EQ. Um, in the effects loop, which is then post um, the preamp channels. Um, I personally feel it's not needed for the amp one, but of course it gives you a lot of different variations again. So you can um, even yeah, get frequencies that you normally wouldn't get out of the amp one or any other amp. This applies to also the whatever amp is in this room that has an uh, effects loop. Um, and to me, it is like, first you should find the right speaker that already is in the right ballpark that shows, you know, feels, and then you can have the EQ to tweak it. I wouldn't have, um, you know, EQ, is like a spice and if there is a great character in the speaker and the amp a touch of that spice you know might make you happy but if if your speaker is the wrong speaker and has a wrong character don't try to to <laughs> tweak the speaker with the EQ to to get to your taste it's torturing the speaker in a way so use EQ, especially post overdrive in a very subtle way. And um, yeah, as you can see with the M1 tone controls, it is kind of a low and high pass filter here, the treble and the bass control. Okay, uh, next Hans-Peter Janssen, um, very German. Very nice information about history and uh, amp developments and of course the beautiful sounds. Uh -huh. uh, well made, thanks. Okay, uh, yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> he just likes what uh, 
what we are doing here. Thank you. Um, Bix, Bix, whoever that is, hi. Sure, it is not comfortable and you are a vers versatile setup, but don't you lose the pure analog analog characteristics playing uh, I are playing feel and latency due to digital effects um, induced before the amp with the helix pre effect source. Ah, okay. Um, the signal is already digital in amp one in. Put uh, into in, in one's input as far as I understand the routing. Um, to have a chance to achieve an analog circuit in at least some playing situation, is there a way of true bypassing the helix? Thanks. Okay, good question. Um, let's put it that way. Yes, if you use the helix we had in the other episode. Um, the Helix is a digital device and the digital device needs to convert the analog guitar signal into the digital domain, process it and re-convert it to analog so then it goes back into the amp one um, Yes, there is a latency and if you have only like one conversion, the latency is not that bad. but. If you have another latency coming from a wireless, digital wireless, or if you have the post effects not in parallel mode, which means you would then kind of um, convert the effect sent into the helix again, and then have the time-based effects like reverb and delay not mixed in that and there's another latency um, it all sums up some people adjust to latency I'm not the biggest fan of it so I would always use the signal path as analog as possible which means my post effects would be in parallel mode with the dry signal and then just have one conversion uh, latency in the signal path um, but there are other pedals and we do have one here that have uh, actually analog pre-effects. So that's kind of a nice way. And I have the setup here, which I show you in a minute, that's using analog pre-effects, so no latency. And I'm using the dry kill switch, which means the, the modulation and uh, reverb effects are post the pre-amps in parallel mode with the amp, which means no latency. So that's the way uh, it also works. Um, but there's many ways how to get there. And of course, every way has a little downside. So the question is, what is the perfect solution for you? I have chosen a solution which is analog pedals in front of the amp and only one digital delay in the effects loop in parallel. So that's my personal puristic analog freak solution that makes me happy. But um, as you could see in the other episodes, um, there's so many great sounds also from the four cable method um, with the digital processor. So yeah. For me, it's about giving you the information and then in the end you have to decide for yourself. And it is about the feel. Does it feel right for you? Maybe you are impressed by the tones, but play it. And then when you know how it feels, that's the moment that is, that's, that's the key moment. Does it feel like this is your guitar? This is, does it feel like you? Or is it, are you playing an effects processor? And if, if that's the case, do something else. If, if it feels like you, it doesn't matter what kind of gear you use, go ahead. And it can be the cheapo strat or whatever. It doesn't need to be expensive or vintage or whatever. Just uh, go ahead. Okay, um, next question. Uh, in chat, viewers are asking, uh, do you know the Rodenberg signature pedal from Tyler Bryan TB drive? What do you think about it? Would you consider to be ah, a, a pedalicious episode about it? Okay, 
Um, let's start. Uh, Petalicious is a little series of videos that I have done on pedals because there are so many pedals out there. And I have um, a friend who owns a store for boutique pedals here in town. And um, so I kind of, um, which the name is Lupus Paradise. And um, I was teaching him guitar when he was 20 and I needed some money and we are still friends. And now he he's getting hands on all these beautiful boutique pedals. So um, I thought um, Pedalicious is a cool thing to show you pedals that you might have not seen before because they are not mainstream. Some, some of them are mainstream because uh, I have a hold on it, but some of them are really special and I want to, to show pedals that they are different. On the other hand, um, yeah, Pedalicious, um, yeah, the combination M1 and pedals always cool. Kevin, um, next one, are 50 hertz ghost notes simulated in the M1? <laughs> if not, did you consider it? No, I don't want to uh, simulate the 50 hertz ghost notes. Um, my good old marshals do that because the L caps, they dry out over the years. And it is always the challenge to have the perfect L cap value or aliveness for the amp. Because if, if there's not enough cap capacitance, um, the sound is very vintage and very great. Um, but has too much of that double note. Um, on the other hand, um, if you have uh, totally new L caps, um, then it's how how to describe it. It's too stiff for me. I'm not. Uh, um, yeah, it's not my cup of tea. And you know, it it the L caps are. Um, in the power supply, filtering the input juice, so to speak. And if they are worn out or dried out, they don't do their job properly. And so there is not enough energy on hand and the frequency wobble gets through and this kind of interferes with the tone that you're, you're playing. Um, you know, there are a lot of crazy noises you can get from vintage amps. That's one of them. And here's another thing you might have heard from, from speakers. It's called the cone cry. So, you know, every speaker has a cone, the membrane. And when you play it very, very loud, the cone starts to resonate and in itself. And there's kind of a saxophone type of sound, which can be really different from all the tones that you heard from that speaker before. And I liked it so much, I used that on my first record with a saxophone player. So my guitar already sounds like the saxophone and uh, the saxophone sounds like a saxophone. It's like we play saxophone. So that's another vintage um, thing with speakers here. Okay, next question. Um, Duncan, hi, will the new Amp X have dual Amp capabilities? No, the Amp X, which is the thing we are working on um, coming next year, um, is a single channel amp. The, this one particular channel is so flexible it can replicate any amp I've ever seen and any pedal I've ever seen. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty, pretty scary project. But it is so complex it has only one. If you want to have two by two. <laughs> Or if you want to have X by X amount, we don't care. Um, we will make some. Um, okay, next question. Scott, digital guitar. Play ah, and by the way, one comment. I believe it's only the exception that you need two amps. Because in my experience, it is great to have one amp that has the perfect character. Of course, there are some situations where you can use two different amps and mi mix and blend them. Uh, it, it depends on your band. And by the way, there's always a, a great job for an amp one when having an amp X to do that kind of setup. Blah, blah, blah. So many, okay. Next question here. Um, 
Scott's Digital Guitar Playground. Okay, very digital. Um, can a multi-effects pedal be used in four cable method using Remote One? Remote One is our foot controller. So um, it does have switching functionalities and the Remote One also has um, the option for a loop switcher, uh, a pedal switcher. So, and that's actually what I'm using on my private pedal board. So the Remote One switches in and out my pedals that I have in front of the M1, which is quite a lot, because I love them all, <laughs> pedalicious. And on the other hand, um, the Remote One switches on and off the effects loop, which brings in my delay pedal. Um, it can also switch um, digital effects because it has a MIDI out. Uh, so there are options. Um, yeah, so the remote one is kind of a four cable method helper. Okay, next question, the Sterling sound. Thomas, greetings from Rome. Hey, nice Italy. I need to go back to Italy one day. I love the country, I love your food, I love everything. Um, the smells of the trees, uh, it's been a while that I've been there. Uh, yeah, I need to go back. Um, you explained the difference once between 60s and 70s marshals. Can you replicate both types of plexis on M1, like loose versus stiff? Well, <laughs> here is the original M1, which is called the silver because it does, is silver and has no name. And this one is the new, the Mercury. Some people would call this more loose and this more stiff. <laughs> but to be honest, I believe both can do both because having three different overdrive channels and the clean channel that you can overdrive, you have so many options in getting the sounds um, of these historic amps and um, well this has the old one has more the tendencies to be more vintagey and this has the, the tendency to be a bit more modern um, but still has all the vintage qualities you know we just played a I think it's a 69 JMP uh, 50 watts versus the vintage channel and there was nothing um, missing. Yeah, anyway. Um, oh, next question. Paul Schlachter. Um, I love the Metal Seal 80 cap in, in the blue box. Okay, why did you call it metal since it sounds great with Foxes and JTM45? You know, so um, we do have 16 different cabinets in the blue box and um, maybe the camera can show which one this one uh, can we see this yes okay so 16 different cabinets you know you all heard my rave about the uh, no signal guys uh. yeah okay so this is the Metal Seal 80. The story about this cabinet is there is a Celestian blah 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 80 speaker. And I found this speaker in a cabinet um, that a metal guy loved. So I have a kind of a Frankenstein cabinet with different speakers in there to be versatile enough for recordings. And this is what I have been using in my studio days. And this is kind of the speaker that I used for that um, setup. And A, that's the beauty of, of, of everything. You can make combination with sounds that you would not even believe that would work. And this is sound cooking. So if there's a word metal involved, it doesn't mean it's shit for a vintage guy. It just means it comes from the metal guys. But, you know, you know, you know the Mesa rectifier, it was not even invent invented for, for metal or this kind of sound. It was 
it was a totally different story behind it. So, no, don't be afraid to experiment and whatever sounds great, sounds great. Go ahead. And this is, I put it in there because it sounds good. And this is my, my other, my personal favorite is the Tweet 112. Which is my 57 Tweet Deluxe. That's, that's another speaker that I found magic. But it's always your combination. I mean, I found my combination back to the stack 1970. This, some people would say, nah, it's not my cup of tea. Uh, but for me, it's, it's what I want to hear. If you, you know, this is why you have the choices. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. Let me see. And Voxy means I have a little bit less gain. Sounds good to my ear. So guys, please try out different cabinets. <laughs> you might find something that um, is, you know, is something the discovery of the day. Um, and then, of course, what we learned with this tone stack is you have to react to it. So if you play that cabinet, maybe you give it a bit more mid. <laughs> Travel. Yeah, makes sense. Switching back to my cabinet, it sounds shit because I changed the tone stack. <laughs> I want my sound back, so... Yeah. But that's me, okay? Okay, we are all different, therefore we need a few different sounds. Okay, next question. Um, you are welcome to play my uh, 1960 uh, seven super bus stack in Rome. Sure. And we have a pizza and um, a nice grappa. <laughs> um, okay, see you in Rome one day. Um, okay, next question. Kevin J. Oh wow, never heard um, of Tone Cry. Yeah. Um, Tone Cry, which track is um, It's called 315 AM on my first solo record, which is called The Beauty of Simplicity. It's like um, a super slow ballad. Fizzy noise because I'm using the switcher again. Any guitar amp switcher makes a little noise. But anyway, um, that's that's no tone cry, just a cry from the guitar. And then imagine the speaker would go like a saxophone killer. Listen to that. Um, okay, um, Mick Rose. Hi, Thomas. Um, how is it possible to tweak out the tone of so many classic power valves when there's only a single nanotube available? Does all the tone come from your preamp and EQ section? No, um, but we create the character in our preamp sections. 
So this is a whole another episode that I will do one day. Um, I'm using the M1 now on five, which is my stage volume. Um, and I believe it sounds the way I want it because um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I designed it for me too. <laughs> and the, the thing about um, amps is this beautiful Marshall or this beautiful Marshall and my Fenders and my Vox and whatever, they all have a sweet spot. And knowing these amps, I thought we have to capture the sweet spot of the amp designs of the tones that I like the most and put them and kind of freeze them into the channels. So you will get, I would say, at least 90% of the tones already from our amp one preamp channels at any volume. And then you can still tweak them with a, a touch of whatever, volume too much for compression or, you know, stuff like that. But if you compare the amp one and the amp design of amp one versus a classic amp, you know, it's like with a tone stack. The classic amp needs the tone stack to create the character. We already have that character in our preamp. Um, but for me, it's also important not to overcook it, which means our preamps are still in a way raw, that they have the full dynamic of real amps and are not like some pedals that give you a tone that just sounds nice, but then doesn't cut through um, because it's like the tone from a record or some digital products have that kind of feel to me. Therefore, the Amp1 is, I believe, the best compromise. This is my aim when designing amplifier to get the most into a usable kind of design that is able to deliver that tone at almost any volume. And then of course, you can make it shine at the right volume in the band. That's the way I designed the whole thing. But even at bedroom volume, the Amp1 will sound killer. And that's a good point. I will make a full episode on what happens with volume and why you are, should not be afraid of using an, an Amp1 at lower volume or higher volume. So this, the thing is super flexible. And I can show you why it is that way. But back to the question about the, the, the tube amps and the designs. I have seen so many of those amps and I know where their sweet spot is. So it's, I think it's boring just to make an AB copy of the original schematics and then have just a clone of a Vox and then there's a one trick pony. No, I want to capture that tone at the sweet spot and use that on our platform with our tone stack and then even be able to tweak that further in the way that it can be used in different situations. So that is the idea behind the M1 concept or my general concept because um, in the old days, the designers were not thinking on that level because they, they were happy to make a tube amp and then uh, whatever beautiful design they have done, it has been used by artists, by guitar players, and then they made that work for them. But, you know, in the old days, people were playing big stages and they didn't have the volume issues we have today. And therefore, I try to find a solution capturing the good old tone and bring this in the format that we can use today in a way that we don't regret anything. We are still playing the real deal electric guitar as it should be like this. Okay, uh, next question. Man, we have to tons of questions today. Uh, Mick Rose, tweak out so many. Ah, no, this, this was the question. Uh, Bob Baumeister, Thomas, with your possibilities humbucker guitar and M1, can you duplicate a tone as full of character as Carlos Santana. Um, yeah, 
I mean, I don't have his guitar, but I can try a few different things to get there. Um, now the question is which tone of Carlos Santana we are talking about. Uh, because Carlos, um, I'm not the biggest expert, but he used to have different tones over the year. Um, he started on modified Fender amps, Princetons and stuff. Um, then he had uh, Mesa Boogie MK1s. I used to have a Mesa Boogie MK2 when I was a teenager for many years. Um, and then he also played any, you know, tube screamers. And we have seen many amps, uh, amps with Carlos. Um, let me see what I can do. First, I I have no pedal here, so pedal on bypass, and, and I'm on the clean channel here. Let me try to start on the good old Santana days by um, cranking the tone all the way up, the gain all the way up, the boost all the way up, yep, and having reverb. So this is old school Santana sound and it's clean volume full on 10 and the boost full. Nothing else. Straight Les Paul humbucker into the guitar. So this is why some people complain about, hey, they have one. The clean channel has overdrive. Yes, because it's like a nice Fender amp, which sounds like that at 10. Um, if you go down and you get a beautiful clean tone. But if you crank it, and now I can do all the tricks with the old vintage Gibson guitars. 50s wiring, it's like roll down the tone just a touch from 10 to 7 and the same with the, the volume. different speaker, I get one of those fans. <laughs> okay, but you get a picture, we are... So this is one, one sound of Santana. Let's try another cooking recipe. Go to the vintage channel and have whatever, medium gain. So we are... Nowadays, Carlos likes to turn the tone down a lot.
this was the vintage channel at Boost. Um, yeah, you can hear. It's, it's all over the place. And then, you know, I can use the classic channel <laughs> just to show you that this part of Oh man, what is uh, I'm missing? I'm I'm not the Santana expert, but I, I would say this is like a Not bad for a studio monitor. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, um, we have the modern channel. And there's. Uh <laughs> I played Santana on all four channels. <laughs> um, I think it's possible. You just have to find the one that you like the most for your whatever period of Santana. Um, okay. Next, Ken Luis Knudsen. Oh, this sounds a bit Nordic to me. Hi, Thomas. Actually, I'm driving to the north uh, by the end of the week. I use M1 with a 2x12 Vox cabinet with Celestion G12M Greenback speakers live. How loud on the master would you say um, is okay for the cabinet? The power handling of the cabinet is 50 watts. Here you are talking to the expert. I was using exactly these speakers a lot in a single 12 with this 100 watt triamp and with the M1 and I could kill these speakers. And um, they are safe. Um, if you have a two by 12, it's pretty safe. I, I would say you can go easily up to six on the master here. So this is, and you will be astonished how loud that is. And here's again, my rule of thumb is if it doesn't get any louder volume-wise, if you just get more compression, stop increasing the master volume. This is where the speaker kind of only gets into more compression and then finally it will stop uh, producing more volume, just it will produce more heat and in the end that will kill the speaker. So no worries about that. Um, yeah. I would say um, you are safe with six, six maybe even seven, uh, depending on your settings here. Uh, and this is pretty, pretty loud. So don't be afraid. And these speakers are still around. In, I killed four, no big deal. <laughs> but this was a single one, which is sheer 25 watts into my amp. And I was, I was, um, I love the, the green bags, yes, um, but uh, yeah, I was torturing them. Here we have um, we have a little thing called um, 50 watt mode. Um, the 50 watt mode is accessible on the M1 um, half power mode, just in case you want to be sure that this amp will never kill anything higher than, than 100 watts, um, you simply press and hold the first foot switch, power the unit on, and that's um, bringing the amp one to uh, half power mode. But, for your setup with two green bags, go ahead, 
use the full 100 watts, there is a little extra headroom and your speakers will be fine. You know, I had my, I had a struggle to kill a single 12 and you will have more struggles to, to, to kill double 12, you know, no worries. Okay, um, more question. Hi Thomas, I use M1 with, oh, that's what I was saying, okay. Uh, Kevin J, uh, any wisdom on overcoming nervous when performing solo? <laughs> um, yes. For me, that's another big, 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 big episode in general. I think guitar playing is a lot of physical and mental thing. And many, many people think about guitar playing as a... a uh, it's like a test at school. You go, you go on stage and people, like teachers watching you, the audience is like, uh, and then you want to perform and you want to show off and you want to show how well you practice and how fast you can play. And then you become nervous. I have a few things. I go with the flow, which is something like, I take the energy that is there and try not to be on a different energy level. Um, but another thing is um, mentally, you know, it is not about being a test, it's about having fun. It's about you make music for yourself first. Be selfish, make you happy first. Don't think about the rest of the world. Be in your comfort zone, you know, many great artists close their eyes because they don't want to see any funny people in the audience watching you. But the point is, um, don't take it too serious. Music is fun. And the other, there will, be, there will be a few things I will probably teach you here as well. I have a, a, a thing which is kind of um, everything I play is in a groove. And when I'm in the groove, I forget about being too analytical. You know, groove is something people dance, people move, people groove. And I do the same thing when I play the guitar. And then uh, it's like, yeah, escaping the reality into the music. And then I'm not nervous anymore. It's like being on drugs without drugs. It's just naturally high. <laughs> um, I teach you in another episode here. That's uh, on my wish list as well. It's coming. Okay, um, I think this were all the questions for now. And we still have a full topic to do. We are so late, guys. Um, let me switch back to my beautiful Stratocaster. Oh, let's use this, this one. And I now go straight into the new X or Nux, Nux, who cares, um, Cerberus. <clears throat> it is a very inexpensive foot pedal. And this foot pedal brings you distortion, overdrive, it brings you modulation effects, delay and reverb effects. Basically everything what you find on the pedal board. So this is kind of a micro pedal board and it is even programmable. So you can have presets, uh, you can store the settings and the best thing about this pedal besides being so cheap is um, you have in and outs for the pre-section and the post-section. So I can use it in the four cable, cable methods. So the guitar goes into the Cerberus. The output of the drive section goes into the input of the amp one. The send of the effects loop goes into the input of like the post-section, delay, modulation, reverb and the output of that section goes back into the effects return of the M1. So this is one, two, three, four cables. Um, so, and what we see 
um, is one, two, three, four switches, A, B, C, D, up and down. You can have presets and you have a MIDI out. So what you can do is... I can switch at the same time my amp1 channels or my settings here if I use the boost which channel I'm on blah 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 the whole uh, MIDI learn function is working with this and this pedal memorizes the settings of the built-in effects of that pedal which is kind of now fully programmable um, yeah it's light light and con uh, um, compact and it offers a few nice features. I show you some of the stuff that I found here. Delay. This is my favorite delay, it's called the 60s delay, which is kind of a tape delay. It's not really authentic, but it's, it's pretty warm. I mean, for the price, it's good. This is the 70s setting, which is kind of a bucket bridge delay. Okay, and there's 80s, which is kind of a digital delay. It more clean repeats. Okay, here's a, a reverb. So now we can have it serial or parallel. So, uh, decay. Oops. Okay, it's too long for spring. And there's a hall. Anyway, you can do a lot of nice settings with this one. Then we have a, a modulation section, which is a, a chorus. A different um, yeah there's a different kind of um, modulation here that there's some some uh, CE1 choruses and um, let's listen I get rid of the reverb This is a C1. Modulation speed. Okay, 
then I have a few different settings for the tremolo, which is this one. And Univibe and Phaser. Okay. Um, so we have modulation effect, delay effects, uh, reverb, and we have two overdrive pedals which um, are in front of the preamp. Um, everything fully programmable. Yeah, it's a nice compact um, device that offers a lot. Um, yeah, maybe we have... Oops, okay. Some overdrive here. Um, doesn't sound so cool with the choral. Um, yeah, you can actually have the overdrive in parallel. You can have the overdrive, uh, you can dial in different things. They're a bit noisy, but hey, I'm not complaining because the whole unit is uh, pretty affordable and it makes a very powerful system. And there is no latency because I use the, the kill dry uh, function. And so I have the effects loop on the parallel setting. Can we see that? Um, here. So the effects like delay and reverb are mixed on top of the dry signal. And that's, um, yeah, this is everything this little box delivers. Um, I think it's a pretty cool unit. Um, it also offers um, some IR loader function with a special software. Um, the only problem I see is we don't get 100% of the power amp field. So I still prefer this um, recording out on the amp one. But if you have your, you know, beloved IR that you want to use, you can use it in Cerberus as well. So um, it's not 100% boutique-y, but it's very good for the money. I'm very impressed about this. Okie doke, I think we had a super long episode today. And um, thanks for watching. Um, do we have a, a last question here? Okay, Michael Irmler, could you say something about the 50s wiring if you use a 300k or 500 in your Les Paul? Thanks. I'm using 500k and I'm using the 50s wiring. Why? Because I get more tones from a Les Paul. Um, there are the different wirings and I'm into all the nuances and especially what I like to get thinner sound when I reduce um, the tone and when I reduce the volume on, on the volume control. So that's the um, beauty of the 50s wiring. And uh, 300 kilo ohm pods um, change the, the peak of the pickups in a different way. Um, in a Strat, I always use 250. It's the original thing. I experimented and I came back to the original well values. Sorry. It's maybe the way we learn to love the instruments. Uh, at least I, I found nothing wrong with the original values there. Okie doke. So this was episode number 21. And uh, stay tuned. I hope you learned something from this and see you again next week. All the best. Bye-bye. Ciao.